Hi everyone. Look, really sorry for the, the issues that we're having, the technical problems. Um, so we've, we've canned that Facebook Live um, feed through the Wirecast system. Uh, Wirecast has been working for us really well for the last month, but it's um, failed us the last day or so. So look, once again, really apologize. We're gonna have to figure out the technical problems that we're having with that program and, and start up again. So I'm gonna start this again. So we start the, the, the whole um, thing off, off afresh. Um, so welcome everyone to Business Legal Lifecycle TV. My name's Jeremy Stretton. Um, I'm a director at Stretton Mason Lawyers um, and with me is Craig Mason. Hi Rob. And we run this um, Business Legal Lifecycle TV um, on a twice weekly basis. Uh, we do a Monday morning um, run through of um, what we call Fast Fix Monday. So ideas about um, technical things that you need to do in your business from a legal point of view. And then a more in-depth um, show on Wednesdays, which um, goes into legal issues and we interview business leaders and thought leaders in, in various areas. Uh, today's program is uh, a little bit different for anyone who's been watching Business Legal Lifecycle TV. And it's our, um, in Street Mason Lawyers, we do a lot of work with accountants and um, this is our Accountant Partnership Plus program. Um, so that's a little bit different. This is much more advice based and going through um, different areas of the law in depth. Um, and the reason that we do this is to provide value for accountants so that they know what, and understand what's going on from a legal aspect for their clients and their business. Our goal out of today's uh, webinar was to present it through Wirecast as our first one, but obviously there's some, some technical difficulties there. So we'll have to start, start that um, again next quarter. Uh, so we do these on a quarterly basis. Uh, this is the third quarter of the 2017 year and we'll be doing another one you know, probably November uh, towards the end of the year and we'll, we'll, we'll fix up those technical issues beforehand. So today's uh, webinar, uh, as you would have seen, is called PPSR Tips and Tricks. So through that, um, we're going to go through a number of different topics um, and to explain to you different things to do with the PPSR. Uh, and what those are going to be is I'm going to go through and explain what the PPSR is. I'm going to also explain um, when to use it uh, because uh, PPSR is one of those little beasts that um, if you don't know when to use it, then you, what's the point of knowing anything about it? I'm going to talk about some of the migration issues that um, have had happened with various parts of the, um, of the PPSR since it came in. Um, and then I'm going to talk about priorities. Now, priorities is probably the most important aspect of, um, of the PPSR. Um, and I'll get, I'll get into that. Um, as I said before, um, if, if you were watching the previous recording that, that faltered, uh, we are happy to take questions through Facebook. Um, they pop up on our, on our feed here um, on the iPad. So please feel free to ask questions and we'll answer them as we go. If you are watching this on the replay, then feel free to either email or, um, or, or, or ask comments on the, on the live feed and we'll, and we'll endeavor to answer them as quickly as we can. So the first question is, what is the PPSR? So the PPSR is an acronym that stands for the Personal Property Securities Register. Now, I'm sorry if this is a bit of 101 for anyone who knows it, but there are still people who don't know what it is. So I want to explain it in a little bit of depth, in a little bit of depth. The PPSR came in in 2012. So at the time of recording, we're in September 2017, and it's been around for um, a little over five years. The PPSR is an online register where we um, can register um, security interests over um, channels, over personal property as opposed to real property. Uh, it's an online database that lets you search what's registered uh, in um, over certain assets. Um, and it also, if you're lending money to people and you want to take security, it also lets you take that security over those assets. So, um, it, so I'll talk about it in a minute about the, the where where it can be used um, and and the different mechanisms that it can be used. But that's what it is. It's an online notice board. Before two thousand and twelve, there was something like thirty to forty different registers around Australia um, that ran the um, security over personal property. So I said before that um, it's security over personal property as opposed to real property. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, anyone who's bought or sold real property over the years will know that there's a real property register um, and it's what we call the Torrance title system in Australia anyway. And I know that's in other countries as well. Um, and, and, and ones that don't use Torrance title use similar type systems. So the um, Torrance title system allows for the registration of owners of property and interests over that property. 
And when, say you've got a house, uh, we're in my house today, if you've, if you've got a registered interest over, over my house, then it would be registered on the tiles register. And basically, um, there's a priority of who's registered first, second, third, fourth, fifth, um, and so on. And those people have interest in your property. Uh, I'm not gonna go into that today, that's a topic for another seminar, but, um, or webinar. Uh, but personal property, I'll, I'll read out a list of different items because a lot of people are surprised over what you can actually get registered um, with your PPSR. So personal property, um, and, and the best way to think of it is anything that's not land, buildings, or fixtures. So fixtures can be things like doors and walls and fit-outs. They're all fixtures. Personal property are things like motor vehicles, uh, boats, aircraft can be personal property. can also include crops, cattle, or other livestock. It can include stock in trade for a business, and that's probably the most common one. Um, artworks um, and other equipment can also be included there. Um, you can also have other goods, new or secondhand, whether they're owned by a business or individual. Uh, you can also have intangible products, such as um, patents, copywriting materials, which we've talked about before, um, and debts and bank accounts. The other thing that you can actually take security over are commercial licenses. So you can't take security on the PPSR over uh, government licenses. So if you've got a liquor license or a food license or any other government approved or building license, you can't give security over those. But what you can do is give security over um, commercial licenses. What do I mean by commercial license? So if you watched our, our webinar yesterday, our seminar yesterday, you would know that we had a, um, we talked about protecting intellectual property and licenses that you can have between different entities. In that, um, webinar, in that webinar, we talked about having license agreements between two different entities. You can actually take security over those over those licenses. So um, yeah, there's, there's many different things you can do um, security over. You can also do um, financial property like uh, shares, cash or checks. Now, cash and checks are probably not something that you'd really bother with these days, uh, especially um, checks, but uh, you can take security over those things with the PPSR. So I just checked, we don't seem to have any questions. So um, yeah, so basically, as you can imagine, when you bring 30 to 40 registers together, um, there's gonna be problems with um, migration issues and I'll talk about that in a minute. But before I did that, do that, I wanted to talk about when to use the PPSR register. Now this is an important topic because uh, it's all well and good to know what things are, and, what, and but you need to know the practical use of the PPSR for your business and for your clients' businesses. So. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is buying goods. So when you're buying goods, you can use the PPSR to register um, and check the register of encumbrances over that property. So what am I talking about there? And I'm, going to, I'm going to give two examples. The first one is if you're a, um, a, a business owner and you're buying someone's business. Um, sorry, I've just had a, a question about what about equipment fixed to land, i.e. a generator. If it's a fixture, then you, you don't get security over the, the PPSR. Uh, it's only security over personal assets. If the generator can be removed then, and it has a serial number, then you can take security over it. In fact, depending on what you're doing, I would, I would probably recommend that. But as soon as it's fixed to the land, it becomes part of the, the property register. So, um, you know, you probably, head, in, in a practical sense, you'd hedge your bets and you'd go both with the property, the, the, the titles register and the PPSR. Uh, but yeah, if it's fixed to the land, then then you you don't need to go on the PPSR register. So what I was saying before um, before that question uh, was when you're buying goods. So if you're a buying um, a business, um, then you want to check to make sure that what you're buying is not encumbered by the um, by a charge over the PPSR register. Now, as I said before, when they merged all these um, registers together. There's many different ways that things are registered. So you might have a register of, um, yeah, you might have had the old um, revs register, which is over motor vehicles, or you might have the asset charges register, or many, one of the many other registers. Those items, uh, when they're put together, are all registered at different times in different ways. So, um, which is really can be problematic for um, when, when you buy businesses, and you have to do searches over each of of the um each of the assets and, and the many different ways that you can have the register um, or you can have um, items registered on the on the PPSR. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is that you might have 
Um, you might want to do a search on a company name. You might want to search on an ABN, an ACN, um, the serial numbers for any vehicles, uh, the engine numbers of any vehicles, any, anything, that, uh, any, anything and everything that you've got as information, you might want to do a search on uh, to make sure that you're not, um, st uh, you're not buying something that, that might have had security that you might not have realized. So that's when you're buying goods uh, or buying a business. The other one is when you're buying a car. So I, I alluded to this, to this one before. When you're buying a car, you, you really want to check to make sure that it's not encumbered um, by, by a register. Now, um, we've, had, we've seen examples before and, and, and um, Craig and I were talking just yesterday about an example of um, BMW didn't do a search on a, on a motor vehicle. Um, so you don't just assume that if, if you're buying it from someone, a secondhand vehicle, that they've done their searches. You want to make sure that what your, um, when you're doing the search, uh, that, or when you're buying the item, that you do the search to make sure that you're actually across um, what is actually registered on that, on that um, the PPSR. Uh, and make sure that if you're buying a vehicle that it's unencumbered. And as I said before, vehicles are a funny one because um, there are many different ways to register a vehicle. Um, you've got the engine number, you've got the VIN and chassis number, you've got the, the registration, you've got the name of the owner. Uh, so you need to do when you're buying goods. You need to do searches on all of those to make sure that what you're being, what you're buying, is what you're what you're after, um, and it, that it's unencumbered. The other point there is that when you're buying goods, uh, a lot of people when they buy assets, they might not get advice from us. They might not get or, or their accountant, um, or their lawyer, or their financial planner. And what happens is that the uh, they don't realise that the um, when they buy it, they buy it in their own name. And so then they go to sell their business in you know, five, six years time and the business assets have actually encumbered and in someone else's name. So when we're acting for people that are buying businesses, we make sure that we do lots of searches on that business and the people behind that business, all of the registration and numbers and all the rest of it uh, to make sure that what they're buying is completely unencumbered. And the search, the search per item is about ten to twelve dollars, so it's worthwhile doing those those searches. The next one and the next time to do it um, is when you're lending money or when you're providing as um, products or services on credit. <clears throat> um, you know, when you're providing products or services on credit, or when you're or when you're you're providing any sort of credit for your for your customers, you might want to have security over that, those assets. Now, Craig is going to talk about terms of trade and retention of title after I finish talking about, about um, this um, migration issues and priorities. But where you are actually doing that, that's the other time to actually use the register. It's really easy to use the register. It's really easy to, to, to log your registrations um, and to protect your, your, your um, clients and their, their money. Uh, but you need to make sure that you uh, register your interest if you're lending money to your clients. Um, the registration process, as I say, is really simple um, and it can be, can be registered fairly quickly. Um, the other time that you might want to use it is if you're leasing, renting, or hiring out goods. So um, if you've got a lease that's more than two years and you need to register it, it's a bit like land. If you've got a, a, a lease of real property and you're going to register it, then you need to have that registered um, if it's more than three years. Here, it's it's more than two years. Um, and even that, that can even involve bailment. So if you don't know what a bailment is, a bailment is basically you, you're leaving some goods with someone um, as security for them to do a repair, like a watch or a car. Um, and if that's the case, then um, you want to bail those goods. And if you if that bailment's more than two years, then you have to register it. If it's under two years, then you don't have to register it. And I'll get into the importance of registration in a minute. But um, yeah, the, the important thing to know is that there are PPSR leases. And if you if you or your clients are leasing out goods or equipment to your to their um, or to your or their staff or their, their um, clients, sorry, then they should be registered on the PPSR. If they're not, then it can be very hard to secure their interests over that over that, that equipment. So the next thing I was going to talk about, um, and I will talk about, is migration issues. I'm not going to go through all the migration issues. Uh, as you can imagine, as I said before, when you've got 30 to 40 registers that you're bringing into one, then you're going to have migration issues. Um, so the, probably the two or three main ones that I want to go through are um, ASIC fixed and floating versus fixed charges. So anyone who um, has was, was part of the old um, regime, um, ASIC used to register charges over property. And you could either have a fixed charge or a fixed and floating charge. Fixed and floating charges were basically over all the items in the, in the, in, that the company owned. Um, and a fixed charge was over a specific item. One of the big problems that happened was 
the when they were, when they brought the registers together, um, a lot of the fixed and floating charges, or sorry, the fixed charges became fixed and floating charges. In PPSR language, they're called all PAP, so all present and after acquired property charges, and um, those charges go over the property. Um, and basically, what happened was a lot of um, clients had multiple fixed items to different lenders. And they all of a sudden became fixed and floating charges over all the all the regis, all, all, over all their assets. Most of the time, the banks have been pretty good. They they haven't really had um, any issues with with acknowledging the fact that they're fixed charges. But it is a problem. Um, and if you've got clients who have multiple pieces of equipment that they've owned since before two thousand and twelve, then it's probably worthwhile them having a look at the. Uh, the, the, the register to make sure that they're actually properly registered. There was an amnesty that expired in January um, this year, so 2017. Um, and so now you have to, if you haven't had it fixed, then you need to actually deal with your your bank to make sure that, it, that, that, um, that they're dealing with it properly. The second, as I said before, the second major issue, and I've kind of, and, and this is kind of second and third, is the migration of multiple entities and multiple registers into one. Um, as I identified before, you've got the problem of multiple um, registers with different things registered in different ways um, means that you really need to do searches um, on all the different types of, of um, ways that, and, and ways to identify different assets that you might be buying. It's now 2017, we're five years on from when this all, this all started. Uh, so you know, it's not as big a problem as it once was. Uh, but in saying that it still is a problem and it's something that you, you need to be aware of, your clients need to be aware of, that they need to make sure that their, that their um, registrations are current and up to date. It's also important to have a look at the underlying security documents because the underlying security documents will talk about what's actually registered. And that's where I get onto priority. So this is the last of the topics that I'm gonna talk about, but priorities is really probably the most important thing with PPSR leases. With, what are we talking about with priorities? Priorities, we're talking about what, depending on what's registered on the PPSR register and when it's registered, determines who has security over that register. So like a land, if you've got multiple charges, um, whoever's first is usually got, got the highest priority, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and so on. The registration um, is an interesting um, topic and it's really important because it's, it's, it's a little bit confusing and a lot of people do um, fall foul of this regime. So if you're lending money to someone to buy an asset and you wanna get what they call super priority, then you should register your interest over that before you lend the money. So how does that work in a practical sense? Uh, the, the way that that works in a practical sense is you, you sign a loan for, uh, an asset, the bank receives that, they then go and register their interest over that property and then they lend you the money to go and buy that asset. That's how most banks and most uh, financial institutions will actually uh, do the lending process. Um, but it's a very important point because you wanna, if you do that, you get what's called super priority over that asset. If you not don't want super priority, which I don't know why you wouldn't, but if you, if you didn't want super priority or you wanted to just uh, protect something else that's not lending money for a purchase of a particular asset, then you've got 15 business days to register that interest. Now, when we talk about registration, what are we talking about? Well, the, the PPSR register is an online register. It's really straightforward. You go to the PPSR website and you register your interest over the assets. You've got to put in all the right details and you've got to make sure that you put the right details in. One problem that we've seen um, very often is getting like the engine number or the VIN and chassis number wrong, and that will actually destroy that person's interest. So you've got to make sure that you have systems in place. And most of the, the big lenders have systems in place that actually protect them and make sure that these aren't problems. But you know, if you've got clients who are looking at to, to register it or you're looking at doing it for your clients, you've got to make sure that you get those details right because if you get them wrong, then you're in trouble. So that's the registration process. Um, you want to make sure that that your clients are getting things registered properly and at the right times. Um, that they, if they want their super priority, for instance, that they're registering it before they lend the money. If they want to get their, um, if they just want normal priority, then they've got to register within 15 days. One question that we get often is, well, what happens if they miss all those dates? Well, you can still register it, but your registration is subject to the other registrations uh, that, that are in those properties. So uh, to give an example, 
if you have a, if you have a company that has an all pap uh, um, security given to save with their bank. If you lend money to buy an asset and you follow the right process, you can get super priority over those assets and that they can't be attacked. If you miss that, then the bank will probably have better security than, than you do. So it's really important to get your, your, your priorities and your dates of registration right to make sure that you're covered. Uh, so that's priorities. If I don't have any questions on that, um, once again, I'd just like to apologize for the, um, the stuff up with the program, but we'll get it right for next time. And, um, and I'll hand over to Craig to talk about retention of title clauses and, and restraints of trade. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, obviously it's a bit up close and personal for today's <laughs> webinar, but it's, it's good. We're getting deep down into PPSR. Uh, and I'll just reiterate what Jeremy was saying about the registration process um, and making sure it's done correctly. Uh, it's something you don't want to get wrong, wrong because if you do, then you might lose your security. So talk to your advisors about it. Uh, make sure you're ticking the right boxes, particularly with the, the PIMSI, the purchase, um, uh, the super priority. You need to tick the boxes and make sure that's mm -hmm. all done properly because if you don't, then you're in, um, yeah, you've got some problems. There is an amendment um, demand process in the Act as well that um, you know requires sending of notices and, and um, giving time frames and those sorts of things to amend um, things if it's incorrectly done or it should have been released. Uh, you know, we've had an occasion where the, the details to log in for the registration were, were lost and the, the, the charge <coughs> should have been released but no one could access it to do it. Uh, so then there had to be an amendment process basically where those notices sent around and, and things were released that way. So. It's um, pretty important to get your registration done properly and to make sure you keep all your details. Um, don't lose your logins. So in terms of retention of, of title clauses, so they've been around for, for, for ages. So retention of title, obviously, if you sell some goods to someone, um, but you don't get paid uh, you know, for a later period, so 30 days after the end of the month, whatever it is. So you retain title in those, in those goods. The way it works under the PPSA is that um, provided you, you have an agreement and you've got retention of title in there, you can now register that, register that interest. And if you do it properly and tick the right boxes, you get that super priority over those, over those goods. The timing of it um, in terms of registration, it should be when you sign the agreement, so prior to um, providing the goods. Uh, and if you do all those sorts of things, then you'll get the super priority. Um, if you miss uh, some of the time frames, then you'll you'll miss your super priority. So it's important to get it right. So obviously, what are the benefits of having it done this way? It's a clear um, set of rules as to how retention of title is going to be governed. So in the past, <coughs> it was you know harder to rely on. There was arguments over the the wording. Um, you know, everyone, particularly you know, liquidators or something like that, is going to raise all sorts of issues with retention of title. Whereas if you do it through the PPSR and you do it correctly and you get your super priority, then there shouldn't be any arguments about it. And provided you've registered and you've done everything correctly, then there's a clear set of rules as to how you can potentially get those goods back or be compensated or whatever it might be. So that's probably one of the main benefits of, of, of doing it. Um, but obviously you just need to make sure that you're doing it properly and, and don't miss the dates. With anything, of course, um, you've got to think about you know, whether it's worth doing it for everything because, you know, if you're providing, you know, four widgets, then you're hardly going to be registering your, your interest. So you've got to take into account, you know, the commerciality of the transaction. Um, we'd encourage everyone to, you know, think about the relationship you've already got with the customer, how long-standing, you know, if it's a one-off thing and all of a sudden someone's chasing, you know, a thousand units or something, then maybe, you know, that's probably one way you'd be registering it because it's a new client you don't know anything about them. Uh, you know, any due diligence that you've done with your credit applications, you know, should be getting references and those sorts of things. So if there's anything in there, then potentially you'd say, okay, well, that's a, probably a good one to register because, um, you know, they might have a black mark against their name or whatever it might be. So all, as always with any of these sorts of transactions, due diligence, getting all your, your credit checks and all those sorts of done, things done before you start providing a thousand units to someone, pretty good idea. And that works the same in this instance. So. Um, then you can work out whether or not it's worth the, the trouble of, or well, not the trouble, but worth the while of you know, registering an interest. Once you register one, then provided it's the same goods and, or similar goods that you're providing to the same customer, then that, that registration should um, continue for that as well. So 
um, yeah, obviously work out the commercial realities of it all. If it's something you think that you should register, then talk to your advisors about it, get it registered, mm -hmm. uh, and then you hopefully will get your super priority. If something goes pear shaped, then you're um, your Superman and you can get to step in and <laughs> trump everyone else. Uh, Not trump, we don't use that. No. So <coughs> that's retention of title and it sort of flows into the next thing that I wanted to talk about and that's terms of trade. So obviously if you don't have these sorts of things in your terms of trade then it's hard to rely on. So we'd encourage everyone, particularly if they're providing goods on credit, to have PPS um, A clauses in their terms and conditions. And they might say to you, okay, well, why, why do I need this? I can't see myself ever using it. But I guess if you don't have it, then you'll never use it because you can't. So it's always a good idea just to have it in there. And if someone says, oh, what are all these things? You know, there's 12 clauses about the PPSA. You can cross it out at that point. But we'd encourage everyone to have it in there so it's available to them if they, if they want. Um, the clauses that you'd include, obviously, is to establish that it is a security agreement that allows you to register your interest. There's a few other things that you can put in there about uh, waiving some of the conditions under the Act about serving notices and providing the verification statements and all those sorts of things. Some of the you know, technical things that need to be done, you can waive the obligations to do that in your terms and conditions as well. So important to get terms and conditions drafted, and we've said this before in previous um, quarterly uh, webinars for the, for the accountants, that terms and conditions, not the time for copy and paste. Uh, make sure it's properly drafted and tailored to the particular business. Uh, speak to your advisors about it. You don't want to be relying on outdated clauses or even uh, American clauses that we've seen sometimes for people not understanding what they're what they're copying. So make sure you um, you know speak to your advisors, get it done properly because getting things registered and those sorts of things, you can see what would happen mm -hmm. if you didn't have your um, registration which flows nicely into the next topic that I was going to talk about, which is enforcing your actual interests. So now we've gone through all that. We've, we've got all the right agreements. Uh, we've got super priority or, or priority, whatever it might be. And now something's, something's happened. So if it's um, that they haven't paid for the goods, for instance, then you can seize the collateral and, and take that back. And you've got the power of, of sale or you could keep it or whatever it might be or... And you can reinstate it as well if, if something changes mm -hmm. where they pay you and then you give it back or whatever it might be. So they're the, the ways that you enforce your interests, which is pretty common sense type, type stuff. Um, most terms and conditions have right of entry and those sorts of things to go in there and, um, and get it back. The other, the other thing, of course, is when it comes up, probably more often than not, is around insolvency events. So you've got your voluntary administration um, and liquidation and those sorts of things. So in voluntary administration, there's going to be some restrictions about enforcing those security interests uh, and you'll have to take some advice um, about it at that point. Same with uh, deed of company arrangements. Uh, again, it depends on what's happening with those. In liquidation, which is probably the, the main time that it comes up, uh, if you've got your registration and you've got your super priority for your goods, for instance, then you can utilise that during the liquidation process. And mm -hmm. that, So that means that that property does not um, or is not part of the, the liquidation from the company's point of view. So they are unable to you know, sell it and recover their, their costs and their fees mm. or for the company as well, of course. So, um, you know, liquidation, if you've got your priorities, then you, you, you can do it that way. Say you don't have your priority, obviously there's still the same applies with proof mm. of debts and those sorts of things. Or you might only have a priority over some of the goods or whatever it might have been. Or say your priority even got knocked back, then you can still go down the proof of debt um, way as well, which is you know, similar in, in that sense. Mm. So that's enforcing uh, your interests. Uh, I don't think we've got any questions at the moment. No, no questions. But um, yeah, I think thank you for watching. Uh, once again, apologies for the um, technical difficulties that we were having. At the beginning, we will um, put this together properly and repost it um, for anyone who wants to um, watch from the beginning to go through the PPSI. So, see, we've had a couple of people join just recently. Um, so, um, what I said at the beginning, um, just to reiterate, um, we're Business Legal Lifecycle TV is a twice weekly show that Craig and I do um, on Mondays. We do Fast Six Monday, and on Wednesdays we do a longer form. This one was uh, more about our Accountant Partnership Plus program. Uh, we do it. We we usually run these um, for somewhere between half an hour and forty five minutes. Um, 
and um, give a bit of information uh, that's useful for you for your business. So thank you very much for watching. Um, if you don't have any other questions, then we'll we'll um, see you on Monday. Please, if you haven't already, like our Facebook page, Business Legal Lifecycle, um, and you'll see the um, the other videos that we've put up there. We also will um, talk to our accounting partnership plus members. We will also send out a, a video um, link uh, to YouTube with this um, and some show notes as well that we'll put together um, just to go through the important things that we've talked about today. So thank you very much. Um, Bye for now from Jeremy Stratton and... Thank you, everyone. Uh, Craig Mason. And also with the accountants, if you've got any topics of interest that you really want oh. us to talk about, <clears throat> feel free to, to comment or send us an email. Uh, we're happy to sort of tailor these sorts of things um, so you're dealing with something that you want to know about, not something that we've suggested. So feel free to do that. Uh, but yeah, as Jeremy said, thanks for joining us. We'll see you on Monday. Thanks very much. Bye.